Riccardo Rosa, uh, who is PhD student of Stefano Baroni, I think in the last year of his uh, um, PhD program, I think. And uh, um, uh, dri driving this uh, hands on session, uh, so Riccardo has been also tutoring in the previous days. Uh, you, you might have uh, met him uh, in some breakout room. Anyway, now I leave to him the stage and uh, uh, having the hands on on Abinishimo Record Dynamics. Thanks, Ricardo. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ivan. Actually, I will be the tutor of the tomorrow hands on, so you will meet, you will meet uh, me tomorrow at, at the GPU hands on. So now we are going to see what uh, the Carpanello code can do in Quantum Espresso. So uh, just a small introduction. So uh, the Carpanello code is able to do, to compute many different uh, types of uh, stuff. For example, uh, the direct minimization of the total DFT energy that uh, was the conjugate gradient that uh, previously Sandro told, that, told you. Then is able to do uh, born Oppenheimer molecular dynamics. That will be the first step that we are going to do later. Then, of course, the Carpanello molecular dynamics, where uh, the electronics uh, degrees of freedom becomes uh, some sort of a classical, uh, uh, classical coordinates, uh, and they are integrated with the Verlet algorithm. Then it is possible, but uh, we are not going to cover this in this tutorial, to do uh, variable cell, variable cell uh, calculation, that is, uh, uh, you let the, the cell to become uh, a dynamical coordinates, so you can fix uh, the pressure and simulate uh, the system at a given uh, pressure. Then the Nose-Uver thermostat that we are going to use to equilibrate the system at a fixed temperature. Then an important difference is that um, this, uh, this code can do only gamma point calculation, uh, that means uh, you do not uh, have to converge the k-point grid and uh, you have to check of course for the size effect that uh, there, can, there can be present uh, so you, you can start for us with a small system and then you can try the same simulation with a larger system and see if uh, the uh, quantities that you compute for the from the equilibrium simulation are the same or not and then uh, also another, another other stuff that uh, I don't say. So uh, let's see what we are going to do today. So we will start uh, with uh, born of Einstein molecular dynamics. That means uh, if well, uh, m times a, and you calculate this with uh, uh, standard uh, minimization. Minimization uh, of the DFT energy. Then we will use uh, the ground state calculated with, uh, uh, within this uh, born oppenheimer simulation to start uh, the Carparinello. Uh, as you, we will see that to start the Carparinello, we need uh, the equivalent of the velocities uh, of the atoms also for the wave function because uh, uh, wave function are classical quantities in, in this uh, Carparinello formalism. So we need the uh, uh, initial state, that is the ground state, and also the velocities of uh, the wave function. And we will see how to compute them to initialize the simulation. Then we will see uh, how to uh, equilibrate the system at a given temperature. Uh, we need to set a temperature. If we start uh, uh, from with the Newton equation, uh, as you see, as you saw before, the temperature is not given. Uh, we have a fixed energy, and the temperature is uh, what we have. So we have to equilibrate with the Nose-Hoover thermostat. After that, uh, we will see that the system uh, is equilibrated at the temperature, and we are able to, to, to run a lo longer microcanonical simulation. That means uh, fixed the number of particles, uh, uh, volume, and uh, energy. Uh, where by energy, I mean uh, kinetic energy of the uh, Ionics degrees of freedom plus the potential energy that in our case will be the uh, potential energy calculated with uh, density functional theory. At the end of the day, uh, we will uh, calculate the pair correlation function that is uh, that was uh, explained by Professor Scandro before. 
and also another dynamical quantities that is the uh, mean square displacement that uh, is able to tell us, for example, if the system is uh, liquid or solid, or if uh, some uh, atomic uh, some atomic types are diffusing, diffusing and other not, or stuff like that. So for today, we are running a, a very small system. Uh, we will have a cubic cell with uh, with uh, eight uh, water molecules. It is very small and very far for from the thermodynamic uh, limits, but uh, it is enough for our tutorial. So uh, just a small recap that for when I say trajectory, I mean the time series of position and everything that is calculated at every time step. We are using, of course, uh, like uh, every day, the uh, bon oppenheimer approximation. Uh, and uh, we are saying uh, that the electrons are always in the ground state and uh, we are not uh, treating uh, nuclei as uh, quantum particles. And that's it. So let's begin with the bon oppenheimer uh, As was explained with, before, we have uh, the uh, Newton equations. So we compute uh, uh, this with uh, the hellman feynman theorem. And uh, to do that, uh, we have to select uh, all the parameters that uh, uh, you selected in the previous day. That is uh, the plane wave cutoff, uh, which pseudo potential you have to, to, to use. You don't have to select the K points because we use uh, only uh, gamma points. And then there will be additional parameters that are the time step in this case. So let's start by looking at the uh, input file for our first step of uh, our tutorial, that is the born open armor molecular dynamics. So uh, you see this uh, input file looks uh, familiar. It is uh, almost the same as the PW code. You set the, the title of the simulation, the type of calculation, you have uh, many different types of the calculation. And now I'm uh, reading the, the input description that you can find uh, in the Quantum Express uh, website. And also in uh, your virtual machine, there is a, a, a shortcut in the Firefox browser. So as you see, there are many different calculations that are possible. Uh, today, we will cover only this one, <laughs> the other are out of uh, this tutorial. Then uh, we start, uh, we have to tell the code that we, we are starting from scratch um, because uh, we will see that uh, later we are using also uh, the restart files that uh, the code uh, will write in the file system. So uh, it is uh, common with the Campanello to, to start from previous, uh, uh, previous uh, runs uh, with the same code. So, uh, this uh, uh, after will be not from scratch, uh, but uh, will be another thing. Then uh, this number means a uh, uh, number uh, directory write. Rewrite. Uh, and uh, uh, basically it uh, tells the code, uh, the name uh, of the directory where it is going to write the restart files that uh, we will read later with uh, the next step. Then you have to tell, of course, uh, how many steps I want in my molecular dynamic simulation. Here, for example, we are doing uh, 100 steps. Then this variable uh, is important. Since uh, usually the time step is uh, very small, uh, to compute uh, the quantities that you want uh, for your research, for example, uh, let's say the, the, the pair correlation function, the G of R, you don't need to save every, every time step of the dynamics. Uh, and uh, if you do that, uh, you, can, you may end up with very large files that are useless because, because uh, consecutive steps are very correlated. There is no uh, so much information in two consecutive steps. So you can say, oh, I want to save uh, one step every 10. So I have a lighter uh, trajectory and uh, enough information for compute uh, all my quantities. Okay, this uh, is telling the code that uh, I want to write uh, a restart file uh, every 1000 steps. Here we don't reach 1000 steps, but suppose 
you're running a much longer simulation. Let's say that uh, runs for a day on a supercomputer. And suppose at a certain uh, point of the day, the supercomputer crashes uh, at, uh, as uh, it can happen. It happens to me a lot of time. And uh, what you do, you don't want to, lo to lose uh, the, the computation of all the day. So you tell the code to write the restart file every 1,000 steps. That can be, let's say, half an hour, one hour, whatever. So you, later, you can restart uh, for the la from the last uh, restart file written. Then this uh, is not uh, necessary. This uh, tells uh, to write the proxies in the trajectory files. L later, we, were, we are going to see the trajectory files. Write proxies. Then the time step. OK, the time step uh, is uh, um, in units of atomic units. Uh, and uh, here, there is a very delicate point. Uh, this is taken from the documentation. Uh, this is very important uh, that uh, the atomic uh, units of uh, the uh, Carparinello codes are different uh, from the PW codes. So there is a factor two. So here in Carparinello, uh, the time atomic unit is uh, this, uh, this value here. In uh, uh, PW is twice that, so 4.8, uh, etc. Okay, this is very important. So here we set this to five. It is a, a really small value if you think about it. And it is useful at the beginning of the simulation to set a small value, especially if you, you choose an initial state for initial atomic position that you, you guessed and you're not sure if they're good enough or not. So you could, for, for example, end up with uh, two molecules that uh, are too near each other. And uh, if you choose a, two, a time step that is too big, maybe this atom displays too much and uh, you, you, you will not sample with uh, enough accuracy the trajectory. So at the beginning, it's useful to, to use a very small time step for the Born-Oppenheimer uh, uh, standard time step. OK, prefix is just the initial part of the name of the trajectory files. Uh, this is standard. Then we are using a cubic, uh, cubic system uh, with uh, a size of uh, uh, 13 uh, bore radius. We will have uh, 24 atoms of two times, uh, hydrogens and oxygens. OK, the cutoff, you have to converge, as in the previous exercises. Here I choose a, a pretty low cutoff uh, just to run faster the exercise, but uh, you have to check that the forces uh, or the, and the energy are converged within this cutoff. So this is something that you have to check. This is in very clear. Then, uh, OK, now we tell what to do with the electronic degrees of freedom. We tell the code that we want to do at every time step of the dynamics a conjugate gradient minimization of the electronic degrees of freedom. Uh, here, the codes uh, for the first step uh, will start from scratch. So we set, I think, a random wave function or some educated OS. Then uh, at the next uh, consecutive time steps, uh, it will use uh, the previous uh, solution of the, for the ground state to, to start with. And then uh, it will minimize uh, this uh, initial gash that is a, a lot better than uh, a random uh, electronic wave function, for example. So you can see, if you look at the output, that the first step uh, take uh, very little time, then the, uh, sorry, very long time for the first step because you start from scratch. Then from, for all the other steps, uh, it will be much faster. Then here we, we say, uh, hey, I want uh, the Newton equation and I want to integrate them uh, uh, with the Verlet algorithm for the ionic degrees of freedom. That means the Ri, uh, all these quantities. Then uh, how do I select the initial velocities uh, of the atoms? Uh, here I tell the code to sample from the uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that is uh, something like a, a Gaussian. Uh, where you have um, the 
the square of the velocity of the atom times k through k dt. Okay, so you use uh, this uh, distribution, this not normalized, of course, you have the normalization factor in front. You sample the velocities of, of the ions from this distribution uh, with a temperature that is uh, 600 kelvins. Okay, then you have the uh, rest of the input. Okay, this, uh, forget about this, it's not necessary. Uh, I don't want to move the cell. The cell is fixed during all the simulation. Then the pseudo potentials and uh, all the atomic position as in the PW uh, code. Then uh, you can see there is an additional, uh, additional. Um, okay, let's go to the director maybe. Day is day eight. Uh, this is the first. Third one, the first input file. At the end of the file, you see here you have, you have all the atomic positions. Sorry. Okay, all the atomic positions. Then at the end of the files, you can have a special card that is specific to the Carpanello code that is able to tell the code to change some parameters of the simulation during the run. This can be useful, especially with uh, the first step of the simulation, uh, because you don't have to write uh, a lot of uh, input files. So for example, here, after 10 steps, I use a, a bigger uh, time step. Why? Because suppose that I am in this situation where two atoms are too near uh, each other. After 10 steps, I suppose, by, I, I'm guessing it is not a, a rule or anything, I'm supposing that uh, this uh, situation is uh, fixed, let's say, so I can use uh, a bigger time step. With the born Oppenheimer molecular dynamics, uh, maybe you can use uh, also uh, time step bigger than that. Uh, okay, this is typical with uh, born Oppenheimer. Then at the end, I set uh, uh, again a small time step. Uh, uh, because this is the time set that uh, I'm going to use later uh, for the Carpanello simulation. Uh, I will explain later why we are using a, a smaller time set uh, with Carpanello simulation. Uh, if you don't uh, do this and you change uh, the time step uh, between uh, uh, restart, uh, different restart files, uh, that means uh, you start, uh, you, you do this, the first input with, let's, let's say, uh, the time step equal to 20 atomic units. Then you stop the simulation, you write the restart file. If you want to restart the simulation, but with uh, a time step, for example, of five atomic units in place of uh, 20, you have to tell the code uh, with uh, uh, an input that is uh, uh, this one. You have to tell the code that you changed the time step. Why? Because in the restart files, uh, there are no, uh, there is no, the, the velocity of uh, the velocities of the electrons and of the ions is not saved. You have only the position at two consecutive time steps. So if the code does not know what was the old time step, it cannot uh, uh, rescale uh, the, the position at the time step before the last one. Uh, to have, a, uh, let's say, correct velocities uh, in the algorithm. So you have to tell this uh, if you change the time step between uh, different uh, uh, runs of the code. Okay, so I think I saved all. We can try to run this. Okay, to run this is very simple. Okay, this is, uh, here we are, the input file. So uh, just to check that you are connected to your cluster with the, maybe you have to run uh, the VPN stuff. I've already run it. Uh, I just uh, have to type remote MPI run. And there is a sorry. MPI run, okay, this one. Uh, just a trick. <laughs> if you press, uh, do you know, okay, it's going. If you pr press uh, Control R, uh, you can look at the history of uh, your bash. For example, here I pressed uh, Control R. That's R. Then uh, you start typing, and you can uh, search in your history. This is very useful. 
when you want to uh, keep a previous command. So this should be uh, very fast. And uh, uh, let's see if uh, it works. Uh, remote, remote school. Okay, this one. So now we are running uh, Born Oppenheimer Molecular Dynamics. Okay, I see the. Uh, how do you select the initial position of the water molecules? Okay, this is a very good question. Uh, actually, I <laughs> I guessed it. I in this particular cases I I selected uh, I put uh, one uh, molecule oriented randomly in the space uh, and uh, I used some uh, uh, symmetry group operations uh, to to move them uh, to move it around the simulation cell. Uh, I do stuff like that. So it is a uh, some sort of art to select the initial position. Usually, I suggest to to pick the crystal one if the crystal is simple, or to maybe uh, also start with uh, classical molecular dynamics. Pick some uh, equilibrated position of your system and use uh, this uh, as a starting uh, initial position. There are also a lot of programs and codes that uh, uh, help you to. Um, to uh, build the initial state for the positions. So let's see if it finished. Oh, yes. So now I copy back, okay, I copy back from the cluster. I think from HC. There is, there are a lot of files. You see in the list, um, You see, uh, okay, the trajectory files, these, those are all the files that the code generates at every time step. Uh, then you have uh, the restart files that uh, are the files that uh, we're going to read later to start the next step. So let's uh, have a look to this, uh, just uh, have a look for the moment. Later we will plot it. So uh, you see there is uh, here, let's start with the, the cell file. You see, this is the prefix A H2O. The cell file is very simple, is uh, uh, the, the cell vectors. Since the, the cell is constant, they are always the same. You see this number is the number of step. This is the time in picoseconds not atomic unit, this is, uh, these are picoseconds. And then you have uh, all the cell vectors. You, cell, you see the cell is cubic, it's quite simple. We can see the position that uh, are the most interesting one, the position file. Okay. <laughs> you see the first line, the, let's say the header for each time step is the same as the, the other file, number of steps and time in picoseconds. This is different time in picoseconds. Maybe I will write it. Uh, time in picoseconds in H2O dot whatever files. Then you have uh, all the atomic position in uh, uh, units of uh, ball radius. Okay, so the positions uh, are in ball radius. Um, and uh, you see, I don't know, maybe you do, now we don't see because we are not looking at it graphically, but uh, uh, the order of the uh, position is the same as the input file. Uh, so if you put the atoms in some in order in the input file, here you find the same order. Uh, note that uh, I've written this uh, question, uh, this, uh, this sign here, because uh, um, this changed in version 6.6 .6 before they were sorted by type and then by input file. Uh, so this changed. In the last version, it is the most intuitive way of uh, writing them. 
Okay, the velocities is the same, but with velocities. Here, uh, time is in at the same atomic unit as uh, before. So, so between velocities uh, in Carparinello and the PW code, there is a factor of two. Then there is the uh, AVP file that uh, has uh, some uh, thermodynamical information on uh, all uh, the quantities. So that, uh, for example, number of step, time, picosecond. This uh, we will see later what it is. It is uh, the kinetic energy of the electrons. But now, since we are not running Carfarinello, it is zero. Temperature of the cell, if you are moving the cell, for example. Then the temperature of the ion, that uh, is something that we are really interested in. Uh, then you find uh, the uh, ethot, that is the uh, potential energy of the system, the DFT energy. Okay, entropy. Uh, econs, it is. Uh, did I write it later? Okay, yes. Econs is uh, the potential energy plus uh, uh, the kinetic energy of the nuclei, that is the, the energy that is conserved. Uh, uh, in uh, a classical molecular dynamics simulation. Then a count, um, it is the constant of motion of the Carparinello Lagrangian that now is not conserved because we are not running Carparinello. Okay, volume is constant, pressure, we are not uh, computing the pressure, so it is there, zero. You have to tell the code to compute the pressure if you want it. So uh, maybe we can see also what happened. I prepared a little script to, to run, uh, to run um, some conversion tools that uh, are not specific to quantum espresso and just uh, uh, are useful to see uh, the results of the simulation. And then I can open the trajectory that uh, the script generated uh, with uh, Ovito, that is a program just to visualize the atoms. So what happens? Okay, this is my system. Uh, you have a different view of the same uh, system, top, bottom, uh, right, left, uh, everything. Um, you see our eight water molecules, uh, and there is not much uh, trajectory in here. We have nine frames, so you see the atoms move really a little. So that's it. Uh, we are ready to go to the next step. Okay, uh, this is a slide just to remember you uh, what uh, uh, does the code write in the restart files. So uh, remember the restart files is specified by this uh, NDW, number directory write, that is uh, uh, the number appended uh, here. So this is 50 NDW. And inside you find the, the, all the data that the code needs to restart the simulation. Okay, uh, now uh, we move to the next point that is uh, a little bit delicate. So, uh, yeah, did I write what's happening? Okay, uh, maybe let's move to this before. Um, so, um, to do molecular dynamics, is, it is useful uh, to express. Uh, the system in terms of uh, Lagrange, that is uh, an expression that together with uh, uh, the euler lagrange equations uh, can define the equation of motion for the system. So in particular, this is the Lagrangian of uh, uh, the Carparinetto method. Okay, uh, my important points are, uh, these are the equations that we need to integrate with the Verle algorithm. So you see that there, there are some parameters, uh, uh, but uh, before the parameters, let's focus on the equation itself. It is a second uh, order uh, differential equations. So to integrate a second order differential equations, you need the initial conditions. Uh, that means you have to provide uh, the zeroth derivative of your function at the initial uh, time step at uh, t equals zero. That means uh, the, position, the position of the atoms, ri, and the uh, initial wave function, that is the ground state. 
uh, then you have to give uh, also the first derivative of uh, these two quantities, so the velocities and the derivative of the wave function. Now, the, the problem is, uh, uh, what is that? Okay, we could, in principle, set this to zero. Uh, don't worry about the parameters, I will explain them later. So this, uh, how, how to guess this? One can think, okay, I put it to zero. It is okay also to put uh, it uh, to zero at the beginning, but uh, it is not uh, really physical. So uh, what we want to do is to find a way to uh, estimate the wave function velocities for the initial condition uh, of the second order, order differential equation. So, uh, as I said, the, the nuclei are, for the nuclei, this is simple, but uh, for the electrons, uh, what to do? Uh, it is not possible uh, to do this. That means uh, this is not possible because uh, uh, this uh, and this can have different different gauge, gauges. Because the minimization of the, the ground state is, is independent. Nothing, uh, nobody told the conjugate degrading algorithm to choose the same gauge for the two minimization. They are independent completely. So if you uh, do this difference, let's say, for example, that this, uh, here there is a, a different phase, uh, you are subtracting something that is not correlated and uh, you get uh, only random numbers. So what, uh, what we do is uh, uh, to do a trick to use the parallel, to fix the gauge practically, and we use the parallel transport gauge. That means uh, uh, we want to compute this. Okay, let's uh, write something trivial. Uh, we write the projector over the occupied main manifold, manifold. And uh, we say, okay, the wave function is equal to the projected to the occupied manifold uh, times the wave function. I write, I've written nothing here. Now let's do the derivative. Uh, I do the derivative of the, the projector, then over the wave function and uh, <laughs> the parallel transport gauge that will not, I will not explain here in the details, but uh, is, it is equivalent to say, okay, I put this term, uh, I define this term as equal to zero. In this way, um, we are able to compute this because uh, this object is well defined. Also, with uh, if I use uh, the finite difference method to, to compute the derivative, that means it it does not depend on the gauge uh, that the minimizer uh, take onto the gauge and choose to compute the ground state. So we do that. We compute uh, this and we differentiate it uh, numerically and uh, we use it to compute uh, to compute a new state at time t using the previous step at times t min minus dt and uh, this object okay in this way you see that uh, if a particular gauge is selected for this wave function it is selected also for this this is the same one and this uh, will have the same gauge uh, same gauge as uh, as uh, t minus dt. So we are okay. We are ready uh, to start uh, the Verlet algorithm. Uh, a little note that uh, right now this is implemented only for non-conserving pseudo potentials. Uh, so uh, if you don't use non-conserving, you will have to start with uh, uh, the velocity of the wave function equal to zero. Okay, now, uh, since we are moving to Carparinello, uh, I will start to explain you the parameters of the Hamiltonian uh, and the Lagrangian. So, I can say this. so uh, you see, uh, there is uh, this uh, mu that is uh, a mass uh, for the electrons. Um, you can imagine the electrons uh, 
I like to imagine electrons are some sort of uh, uh, classical fluid. Like you have the, the potential, you have uh, a bowl, let's say, you have some water inside it, and this water has a mass that is moving. <laughs> okay. Uh, then there are other stuff that uh, maybe it's not very important, but you have to know that uh, it exists, that are uh, orthonormality constraints. Uh, that are needed because you want uh, the wave function to be orthogonal to each other. So there is a standard method in Lagrangian mechanics that is to put uh, some uh, Lagrangian multipliers that uh, are here only to ensure that uh, the wave function are orthonormal to each other. So these uh, are quantities that are computed by an iterative algorithm and uh, produces some sort of uh, additional forces on the wave function that uh, make sure that uh, the wave function are orth orthonormal each other. Okay, then, uh, okay, explain this. This is the electronic uh, uh, fictitious kinetic energy that is called uh, Ekin C in the output files that is the equivalent of the uh, kinetic energy of the nuclei, but for the electronic degrees of freedom. Uh, but the here is by far more complicated because uh, mm, you see, uh, you don't have, uh, uh, here you have, uh, for example, uh, we have in our case, we have uh, 24 atoms, uh, but the, here we have a lot more degrees of freedom. That is the number of plane waves uh, uh, that is called NPW, for example, times the, the number of, uh, of, uh, of bands. So uh, you have a lot of degrees of freedom inside here. Um, and uh, the kinetic energy of all these degrees of freedom is called the electron uh, fictitious uh, kinetic energy. In the code is written in C in the output files also. Uh, so that's it. Then uh, ah, the mass parameter. How to choose uh, the mass parameter? Okay. Um, as uh, Professor Scandolo told you before, what we want to do is to have this uh, potential. We have, uh, let's uh, suppose uh, for simplicity that uh, the, the electrons are like a fluid, like uh, water inside a bowl. The potential moves. And we want that the water moves uh, with the bowl and does not go outside. So suppose, for example, that um, you use a very large mass for this uh, electron, for this water inside the bowl. It will be very difficult to move the balls. And uh, if, uh, if this, this is uh, an ion, you will have that the mass of the ions is like the mass of the ion plus uh, uh, an additional mass that depends on the mass of the electrons that are attached to the ions. I repeat again, electrons are like uh, some classical fluid that is uh, attached to the ions uh, by the DFT potential. So if you choose a new, uh, an electron fictitious mass that is too large, uh, you have these issues, but uh, this is not all you will have another issue that is uh, uh, the issue of, um, of the coupling between the electronic degrees of freedom and the uh, ionic degrees of freedom. Maybe I can add another. So what is the issue? Is, um, it is that uh, We have two systems, different systems. We have the ionic system and the electronic system. We want that uh, the electronic system stays uh, always cold. That means uh, uh, the electrons are near the ground state and keeps uh, oscillating near the ground state. But uh, uh, what happens if uh, the two systems uh, exchange energy? Since the electrons are very cold 
and the ions are hot because they have a temperature like a few hundred degrees or, or kelvins or more. Uh, if the, there is a, an overlap between the frequency of uh, the ionic system and the frequencies of the electronic system that are very fast because the electrons are light, uh, if you choose a low enough uh, fictitious mass, if there is an overlap, let's suppose that uh, those are the frequency. This is the ionic frequency, and this is the electronic uh, system frequencies. If there is an overlap, uh, the energy will start to go from the ionic system to the electronic system. So what happens is uh, something like that. The energy of the electronic system goes up, and eventually uh, the electrons will go out of the ground state. And you will end up with very ex expensive uh, random numbers. So what you want is that the highest frequency of the uh, ionic system is uh, smaller by a big enough amount uh, of the uh, uh, smaller frequency of the electronic system. And it turns out that uh, oh i duplicated this slide okay that uh, the smaller system of the electronic system uh, is proportional uh, like i i call it uh, in the smaller frequency of the electronic system is something that goes like uh, the uh, the gap uh, the electronic gap of the system over the fictitious parameter over the square root. So you see, if you put uh, here a too large number, um, eventually the, this uh, small frequency will overlap with the frequencies of the ionic system, energy will exchange and the electrons will go away from the ground state. So as a rule of thumb, uh, I start with uh, an EMAS, that is uh, the name of all the mu parameters in the input file, of about uh, 50, uh, 15 uh, units of uh, atomic units, 30 atomic, atomic units, uh, that is a reasonable enough value that uh, usually allows uh, um, to, to have uh, a good... Uh, uh, allows the electrons to follow the minimum very well. Then uh, there is another thing on the other side that uh, since uh, you are integrating uh, the electronic degrees of freedom with the Verlet algorithm and you want, you want a, a long enough simulation because you want to simulate, for example, one picosecond, let's say, uh, if you choose uh, the, the lower the uh, the mass that you choose, uh, the faster uh, will be the oscillation of the electronic degrees of freedom because uh, they are lighter. If you have a lighter uh, uh, object, it will uh, run faster. Uh, so uh, in the Verlet uh, algorithm, there is a part, as you saw before, that is something like that. You have a mass, then you have a delta T squared. So, if you divide this by two, let's say, to have the same magnitude of the displacement, we have to divide also this by the square root of, uh, of this. So uh, the lower the, the electronic mass, the lower the time step. And since the electronic mass is the uh, lighter, uh, lighter element in the system, uh, you have to choose a smaller time step for the, the wall simulation. So you have to balance between a small time step and an accurate enough simulation. Uh, this usually is a good guess uh, to start with. So let's go uh, in, through the input file. Okay, calculation restart. Oh, maybe let's see it. Sorry for being long, but there are a lot of concepts here that I find uh, very interesting, by the way. So uh, CP molecular dynamics. So you see, we have to change a few few things. We want to restart. That means we want to read uh, the ground state and the electronic velocities from the restart files 
that uh, we had we calculated before with the previous run and with the velocities calculated with the projector trick let's say we have to tell the code number directory read that uh, is the number that identifies the folder where the code is going to read the restart files then you have to tell number directory write and uh, i increased this uh, by one to not uh, overwrite the previous directory so if i want i can restart again from uh, the previous calculation then i want uh, more steps and since uh, carpanello is uh, usually cheaper for steps for for a single step i can put here a much bigger number then uh, this is very important. This, uh, this uh, switch on the Carparinello equation of motions. So if you tell the code electrodynamics uh, equal to Verlet, uh, that is here, the electrons name list, uh, you, you, we are using the equation of motions of uh, Carparinello. Uh, then the last very important thing is to set uh, an EMAS to a reasonable value. Uh, you can start from this and then see if it is possible to increase it. Then we will see uh, how to check uh, that the mass is good enough or decrease it if uh, the simulation uh, does not go goes uh, well. As I said before, if you choose a too large mass, it, it, uh, it uh, can happen that uh, this becomes too low and uh, uh, the electronic system and the ionic system exchange energy, uh, electrons uh, heats up and uh, everything uh, goes bananas, as the code uh, will tell you. Uh, ion velocity is equal to default, uh, tells the code to read the ion velocities from the restart file. Remember to not forget uh, here random, otherwise uh, velocities uh, will be overwritten with the new one uh, velocities. And also the autopilot card is not uh, necessary anymore. Okay, yeah, the, uh, everything is the same. So now we can submit uh, also this. I use the reverse search trick that I like very much. So remote MTA run equals. And uh, if you press Control R and more time, you see you see the command. So this is two. Two. Carpalino molto dynamics dot in. So I run it. I hope that I'm not saying too much stuff. Okay, uh, some somebody asked uh, what is the K nuclear. Maybe I did not explain it. Uh, better but enough so um this is uh, okay the a dft is this one a dft of uh, the previous slide that is okay this is a uh, k nuclei i called this part uh, this part is uh, the kinetic energy of the nuclei Uh, and this uh, the, is the kinetic energy of the electrons. Okay, now we are going to see in more details the output because we will have more. So let's see if something happened. Now we will see in details uh, all the output and why some parts, uh, some energy change, some other energy does not change. And so, okay, it worked. A sync from ATC. You see, there is a, a new folder of the new restart uh, directory. 
and uh, the trajectory is updated. Uh, an important thing, uh, if you keep the same prefix for the trajectory, every time you run the code, the code is going to uh, append at the end of the file the new uh, quantity. So it is not going to overwrite the file, but it is going to append uh, new atomic position, new atomic velocities, new cell vectors, new thermodynamical quantities at the end of the file. So don't worry. And uh, the time step, the number of times is uh, always increased between uh, each restart file. So uh, when you run the new uh, the new input, uh, the first step will be the number the same with the same number of the last step of the previous run. So um, I already showed you uh, how the output appears in the terminal, but now let's use a new plot. I prepared a small script that uh, it's nothing special. You can see it. It is uh, it plots some columns of uh, of the output files. So I will run it. Go oh, at plot thermo. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, if you press tab in the terminal, uh, the terminal will try to autocomplete uh, what uh, you're writing so you can type faster. Okay, I hope that this is clear enough, uh, these, uh, these plots. Uh, so what uh, we are seeing here, we are seeing the output of, uh, let's put the grid. Um, the thermodynamical output of, uh, of the code. So uh, you see uh, here, there are the few steps that we ran before with uh, the conjugate gradient uh, algorithm. Then here at this point, uh, we switched off uh, conjugate gradient. We did the restart, uh, the restart file. Illegal extraction, very nice. <laughs> uh, we did the restart file. And uh, uh, from this point on, we are now running the Carparinello algorithm. So here I'm plotting. Uh, this is the constant of motion, this line in between. Maybe I can zoom. OK, you see this, uh, this line here. This line here is the constant of motion of the Lagrangian. Each Lagrangian uh, has many constants of motion. And uh, if the integration time step is uh, small enough, this constant of motion will be uh, constant within uh, numerical accuracy. That means that uh, the parameters of your simulation are good with respect to the Verlet integration. So it does not mean that the simulation is good. It means that the, the, time, the time step, the delta t, is small enough. Then uh, I printed the electronic kinetic energy. That is uh, this quantity here. Uh, and uh, I shift uh, it uh, from this point. So the electronic kinetic energy is only um, from here to here, it's only this one. And uh, you see that is uh, appro approximately a constant. So if the simulation is good, this electronic kinetic energy will be more or less almost the same during the simulation if the temperature does not change. Uh, that means that uh, there is no exchange of energy between the ionic system and the electronic system. That in turn means that uh, probably your, uh, the forces that you are calculating are good enough. Uh, so you have to check when you run the Carparinello uh, equation of motion that uh, this uh, kinetic energy of the electrons is uh, all, always the same. If it is uh, always the same, means that uh, there is no uh, energy transfer between 
the nuclei and the electronic degrees of freedom. Uh, so uh, you can trust the forces that uh, uh, the code is computing for you. Then, uh, okay, the constant of motion is nothing physical. Um, it is not like the energy of a classical simulation because you have uh, uh, this term inside it. So the constant of motion, maybe I wrote it before. Yes, a count. Uh, this is called a count in the output file. It is the potential energy. This is potential energy. Plus uh, the kinetic energy of the ions. It is uh, something uh, physical. Plus this part. This part is uh, not physical. Not uh, there is no physics inside this uh, number because it is only. Uh, an energy that uh, arises from the way that you are using to, to minimize, uh, let's say minimize, but it's not a true minimization you see, you saw before. Uh, it is a, a kinetic energy that uh, arises from the way that you are using to compute the forces at the end of the day. So it is not uh, related to a physical quantity. It's all, also because uh, if you change the move, if you change uh, the the fictitious uh, uh, mass of the electron, this, this number here, the kinetic energy changes, so it is not something physical. So this constant of motion is something useful, useful to know if the simulation is good, but it's not uh, something physical. The physical uh, energy is the sum of the nuclei uh, kinetic energy plus the DFT potential energy, the DFT energy. Uh, that is uh, this uh, line here under under uh, the concept of motion. And by the way, you see that uh, <laughs> you, it is evident from this plot that uh, the concept of motion is uh, this plus the the electron kinetic energy. You see that the plot are mirrored around the concept of motion. So uh, if your simulation is good or is uh, now, if your simulation is good, the physical uh, energy, the physical total energy of the system will be more or less a constant. Okay, then let's see if I have uh, to say something more. Okay. Uh, the potential energy also in this case, uh, when the system is equilibrated, the potential energy will oscillate around uh, a constant value. That is, okay, in this case, the system is, uh, the simulation is very short, so it, it is difficult to say if uh, later this, uh, this energy will stay more or less constant or, the, or it will go up or down or whatever. So, but uh, since now it seems, uh, everything seems okay. So then, uh, okay, here I wrote something about the forces. Uh, you can, okay, the forces, uh, as I told you before, and uh, also as uh, Sandro Scandro told you before, forces are not uh, exactly the one that uh, are uh, given by the PW code, for example, because uh, uh, the ground state, uh, keeps oscillating in, um, in the minimum of the, of the potential. And, uh, and it is not uh, always exactly the same, but on average, the forces are about the same of the one that uh, the code pw.x uh, calculates. But uh, there is another fact that uh, maybe you can imagine that uh, if, uh, uh, let me put another time. If, uh, mm, let's say that this is the potential, uh, here you have uh, the electronic degrees of freedom that has a mass. So uh, you have a mass that is uh, added uh, to the ionic mass. How is this reflected in the forces? It is reflected in the fact that uh, the forces calculated by the CP are 
a fraction of the forces calculated with the true born oppenheimer uh, method and uh, this is something that is usually like uh, 99 something like that so it is nothing that uh, you have to worry about but be, but be aware that if you put uh, this uh, too large this number can, can go to something like uh, 0 0.8 so um, you have uh, if you are computing uh, statical properties of the system uh, those does not depend on the mass of the of the ions plus the electrons let's say but if you're computing dynamical properties like your diffusion coefficient you have to be careful because if you choose a move such that the forces calculated by Par Parinello are off by a factor of this um, you are computing wrong diffusion coefficients so be aware of this fact. So here I was suggesting to compare the forces at a part of the factor two with uh, uh, an electronic mass of 50 atomic units, you should not uh, see nothing, uh, nothing strange. So you should see that the forces are more or less the PW1. Okay, so this is done. Now let's move to the next step. Uh, how we can choose the e mass of the electrons? I told you before you can start uh, with the e mass of uh, 50 or something like that uh, as an educated guess. Then uh, you can check, uh, first of all, if uh, there is no transfer between the ionic degrees of freedom and the electronic degrees of freedom. That means uh, that uh, in the plot, uh, of, uh, of the kinetic energy of the electrons, the kinetic energy of the electrons remains more or less constant. Then as a last step, you can check the ratio between the forces calculated with the Carpanello method and the forces calculated with the born oppenheimer method. Uh, if the mass is low enough, the forces would be similar within oscillation, oscillation typical of the Carpenter method, but uh, that uh, are not uh, harmful to the simulation. Okay, then let's start with this uh, thermostat. So, as Sandro told you before, uh, if you start with an initial condition uh, chosen uh, randomly, let's say, uh, you will never get the temperature that you want. So uh, let's switch on uh, uh, the thermostat. Why did I this to go? Okay. Uh, thermostat. Let's go. What did I do? Hmm. Switch desktop. Very nice. Go away. Okay. Vim. Water. Eight. Three. No, say over. No, they were. So, increased by one number directory write, uh, read and number directory write. Uh, as always, we don't want to have a write restart files because we may want later uh, to restart from uh, a previous step of the simulation. So, we increase this. This has the point, of course, to a valid, uh, to a valid uh, restart directory. Uh, then I want uh, more steps. 5,000 uh, looks uh, to me enough. Here there is no a precise uh, recipe. Uh, it depends uh, really on the system, uh, the time needed uh, to equilibrate at a given temperature. You will have always to look at the output files and see if the system is equilibrated or not. So to switch on the Nose Hoover thermostat, we have to put in the name, name list the ions, uh, this, and the temperature in Kelvin. Uh, what was that? Oh, very nice server, by the way, on the Slack chat. So, where is this? Uh, okay. You see, uh, ion dynamic relay, ion velocity is default. That means you copy the velocity from the previous restart. The temperature of the thermostat, the ion, ion temperature nozzle. Then there are two additional parameters 
that are very technical. I will not explain them. If you're interested, you have to study the way the Nuse Uber thermostat works. But uh, uh, just uh, you have to know that uh, there are additional parameters that are explained here, for example. Uh, you see uh, ions, you have uh, a NOSEP that is uh, explained here. It is just a parameter that you can tune to uh, have a better equilibration at uh, your temperature. And also, this is the number of chains uh, in the non over thermostat. It is, a, it is a very technical thing. Uh, just you know that they exist. So, if uh, it is difficult to uh, equilibrate your system at a given temperature, you can try to change this parameter and see what happens. Uh, this uh, usually you can choose so it, um, it overlaps more or less with uh, some peaks in uh, the vibrational spectrum of. Uh, your ionic system. Okay, so let's submit this uh, to the cluster. Where is my So remote MPI run, and it is step number three. Mosaicover dot in. It will take a little bit. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Yes. Now that are uh, you're waiting, there are questions on the YouTube. If I... Yes. Particularly, uh, one ask if uh, I can use any time of any any kind of pseudo potential for the Caparinello. Uh, as far as I know, yes. But be aware that, for example, the uh, with function velocities uh, feature that we used uh, at the end of the born oppenheimer step that we did uh, first before uh, it is implemented only for non-conserving pseudo so there are some features of the code usually the the more advanced the, they are <laughs> the less the number of pseudo potential types that are in, implemented so for example for non-conserving you have everything implemented and uh, but uh, yes there is no you can use uh, whatever pseudo potential you think is good enough for your system for uh, um, ultra soft pseudo potential there are additional parameters uh, that maybe i'll explain here in the input file that is this number here uh, it, it uses a different algorithm with respect to the pw code and you have uh, to specify this number for the ultra soft that are some sort of grid that is uh, around each atom to to contain the uh, ad additional charge if i'm not wrong okay so be aware if you use ultra soft there is this additional uh, input that you have to provide and then yes you can use uh, whatever you want then there is another question if uh, you, you can use the optimized gamma trick. A, oh, everything is gamma trick. Exactly. Because we have only gamma point, we don't have k points. Uh, so uh, you have to check for convergence with respect to the system size uh, in place of the convergence with the k points. And uh, the codes uh, use only gamma tricks. Then, uh, okay, uh, then no set of parameters. Uh, um, you can leave the default, basically. Uh, the recommendation is uh, if uh, your system does not equilibrate fast enough, you can try to plot the vibrational uh, uh, density of uh, uh, your ionic system and uh, try to choose a value that uh, overlaps with it. Uh, for example, in my case, uh, I, I put uh, 10, I'm not wrong. Yes, I put 10. Okay, this is a frequency in terahertz that uh, has to overlap in a good way with uh, your system to 
uh, enable a faster exchange of energy between the thermostat uh, degrees of freedom and the ionic degrees of freedom. But it's uh, really technical, this one. Uh, it's better to do some trial and error and see what happens after reading of a, bit of, a little bit of theory, of course, so you know more or less what you're doing. Okay, I think that maybe the, the, the code is finished. They are all a very fast run. Remote, uh, square web. Yes, yes. Uh, sync from APC. Oh, the new trajectory. So. Now say over. Okay, now we do the same step as before to see uh, what happened. So our friend, the new plot. Let's plot the same stuff. Oh, interesting. So uh, you see, uh, the data is always appended at the end of the file. Uh, here at the beginning, you have the plot that uh, oh, that uh, we had before. So this is exactly the plot that we had before. But then uh, oh, we switch on the Noseover thermostat. Uh, from this plot, what you can see, this is the physical total energy, that is the kinetic energy of the ions plus the potential energy for the ions that is in that uh, in this case is the, the density functional theory uh, total energy. Uh, you see that uh, it starts to oscillate. It is not more an approximate constant of motion because I remember you that the, the exact constant of motion is the one that includes uh, also the electronics uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, plus, of course, the thermostat degrees of freedom that are the additional variables that you introduce uh, in the equation of motion to, uh, to fix the temperature. Uh, you see that it changes because you switched on the thermostat. And uh, more or less, after a certain time, you see that uh, it starts to oscillate uh, around uh, some values. So, so it looks like it looks like. Uh, uh, the system wants to equilibrate around this uh, physical total energy. Then you can see that uh, the uh, electronic uh, kinetic energy went a little bit down. Why did uh, it went down? Because the temperature of the system uh, is lower. Ah, by the way, uh, later I have to show to you, to you also the temperature, of course. And you see also that uh, the constant of motion of the Lagrangian is a constant of motion. So we are happy that uh, our time step uh, is uh, small enough. So it looks like uh, everything is going uh, well. This is the potential energy. It is equilibrating around another different values, of course, because we switched uh, on the thermostat. And, uh, Okay, let's see the temperature. Uh, the temperature is above uh, column five, I just remember. This is later. Five, yes. Okay. Uh, you remember that at the beginning we chose the temperature of uh, six. Uh, 100 Kelvin for the initial uh, initialization of the temperature with sampling from the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. I wrote it in the first input file. Yes, it was here, 600 Kelvin. But uh, looks uh, the system choose a temperature that looks like uh, whoa, <laughs> the double of uh, twice uh, 600 Kelvin. Why? Because as I said before. Uh, the initial state was guessed by randomly. So, so apparently there was a, it was a configuration where there was too much potential energy. So when I started the Verlet algorithm, uh, the system uh, took all this potential energy and uh, and uh, this uh, 
went into kinetic energy, so temperature. Then I switched on the thermostat at, uh, at this point. You remember we did, uh, we did uh, 100 steps of conjugate gradients of so this, uh, the very, very beginning. 100 is uh, here. You see on the uh, bottom left corner, there is the uh, X and Y values for the plot. So here I switched on uh, the Verlet or Nick Carparinello. Then at 1100, that is uh, here, I switched on the Nose Hoover thermostat. You see the system goes down with the temperature very fast, and then it equilibrates around the value that I selected is 600 Kelvin. Thanks to God, it is the right value. Now I'm going to switch off the thermostat and let's see what happens. So the participant can now see your thing. <laughs> Why wasn't it also before? I don't know. So let's uh, go ahead. So now uh, our simulation is working very well, but uh, now I'm going to explain you um, a little trick that can be useful if uh, the simulation is more problematic. Uh, what uh, do I mean uh, with more problematic? I mean that uh, maybe there is uh, uh, some energy exchange between the uh, electronics degrees of freedom and the ionic degrees of freedom. Uh, so the kinetic energy of the electrons start uh, to go up and maybe, I don't know, maybe it is uh, too high or the forces are starting to, to become uh, random numbers. So uh, it may happen that you need to minimize again the ground state. So what do we do? We do the same thing that we did at the beginning, but in this case, we need the only, oops, we need the, only only one step because uh, uh, one step is enough uh, uh, for minimizing. Uh, not that uh, uh, we stole the one step in the input file, but in reality, the code does uh, two GG minimizations. If uh, uh, the norm conserving pseudo potential is used. Uh, it does one minimization for uh, t minus dt and one for t, then it co computes uh, the projector and then it computes again so the c t minus dt wave functions. Okay, so it does, you select, uh, you say one step, but inside the, uh, inside the code does uh, uh, two, two steps of uh, conjugate gradient to compute the projector over the occupied manifold. So uh, this is easy to do and also very fast because we have only one step. So let's see the input file. Water 8.4 uh, conjugate gradient. Okay, the start model start. As always, I increase by one number directory read and number directory write. Uh, I do again conjugate gradient for the electrons. So no Verlet algorithm, no Carparinello. We are doing oh, what I did. We are doing a, a Born Oppenheimer uh, for only one step and uh, ion temperature not controlled. So I switched off also the Nose Hoover thermostat. Okay, so we do another minimization. Let's see if I forgot something. Okay, the time step I left the same as the uh, Verlet algorithm with the Caparinello. So I don't have to use the ugly uh, change time step uh, input of, of, the, of the code. Everything is the same. Okay, the electronic mass, uh, in fact, is uh, ignored when you conjugate it, but I left here, uh, nothing happens. Uh, okay, here everything is the same. Ah, uh, I forgot to tell you, uh, this part of the input file, the atomic position file, is the same that I used at the, the beginning. But uh, if you restart, use the restart feature of the code, this part will be simply be ignored. So you have to put it, it is sufficient to copy and paste the, 
the atomic position that you have from the first input file, uh, but the code uh, will not uh, use this position to do the computation. It uh, is going to use the position rather with, uh, from the folder number 52 uh, with their start file. Okay, so this is very a very fast calculation. Okay, uh, there are some methods that uh, run are slow. Okay, we will, I will go slower, but now it's uh, almost finished. The, the decoder. So don't worry. Uh, what I was about to. Okay, submit the minimization. This is a very fast step. Uh, Or twenty game is got in. So now we are using I'm doing this to use this trick. We compute uh, a new ground state. And we compute a new ground state uh, velocity, let's say. So we are happy. Uh, and why this is better than a velocity of zero? Because uh, this is somewhat consistent with dynamics of the ions. It's like, uh, suppose, uh, as before, the example with the water and the bowl. <laughs> so if suppose that everything is moving, uh, or uh, let's say accelerating, is accelerating in this direction, okay? The water is like this. And uh, here I choose a velocity that is consistent with uh, this acceleration. If I don't choose this, uh, maybe <laughs> it can go the other side like this and then like this and it's not uh, okay. You will have at the end of the day more uh, kinetic energy for the electrons. Also, if you start with zero, a velocity of zero, imagine that uh, you are on a running car with a bowl of, uh, bowl of water on the top of the car. <laughs> if the velocity of the water is consistent with the velocity of the car okay it's okay if you put some water at rest uh, on a car that is running the water will start uh, going out of the boat okay uh, it will gain kinetic energy okay uh, so i think that uh, the optional step I, I stress again i repeat again this is optional in our case, it was uh, not needed because uh, our simulation was good. But if you have a um, problematic situation where the kinetic energy is increased, with this uh, with this uh, trick, you can uh, cool down uh, the electron near the ground state. Okay, for sure, this is finished. Okay, I get the new restart. As you see, uh, the code did not copy uh, new trajectories, uh, new pieces of trajectory, because I did only one step. And um, since I asked the code to print, uh, to print uh, the trajectory every time that the number of steps is a multiple of 10, in this case, uh, did not print, uh, the code did not print uh, anything. So uh, now we start the last step that is like the steps previous to the uh, equilibration with the nose over thermostat. And this is, uh, you can, we can see the input file. Uh, in 50, what, right. We have number five, the last step. Okay, you see always increase this uh, number directory read and write to point to the right directory. Okay. 
Okay, then job, uh, the long running job seems to me. So uh, now I want a lot more steps because now I want uh, to calculate some uh, thermodynamic quantities from the trajectories. Uh, so we are going to compute the pair correlation function and the mean square displacement. So to compute these quantities, we will leave, we need uh, a lot more steps than uh, 1,000, a lot more step uh, than uh, 10,000 probably, but uh, just to see something, now we put 10,000. We switch uh, again on the CP, uh, equation of motion. Okay. Uh, this is the input file. The time step is always the same. Perhaps always the same. Everything is the same. E e ion temperature not controlled. Ion velocity is default. That means read them from the start file. Here nothing. And here I have always the same uh, position that are not uh, uh, used by the code which are using the start feature. So let's submit it. Remote MPI run, quote rate five. NVE, that means for uh, constant uh, number of atoms, constant volume, constant uh, uh, total energy. That is the microcanonical ensemble. As Professor Scandal said before, uh, if you want to compute uh, dynamical properties, like the diffusion coefficients, uh, you have to use the microcanonical ensemble. It is the one with the, the right equation of motion for the uh, uh, ions. So you, if you use the, the thermostat, uh, the thermostat uh, adds some forces uh, on the ions that are not physical. So you're not getting uh, physical trajectories. You can get the physical averages, but uh, for dynamic quantities, no. Okay, this uh, will take a little bit uh, longer, like uh, 10 minutes, or maybe. On C, it is about uh, five minutes, but uh, if somebody took uh, seven minutes, anyway, you can see the what happens at the end. In the meantime, are, are there any questions? Let's see. I think we I think we took most of the question. Uh, okay. Don't see any open. Okay, maybe we can look at the trajectory that we have now. <laughs> okay, so we leave uh, we leave space to the to the lab, no? Leave place to no. I mean, uh, is this is this finition over? Uh, I or? think so. We are waiting for the for the result of the last ah, session, sure, sure, okay. and then uh, we are going to compute some something uh, interesting. Okay, sure. But we have to wait a little bit. Ah, uh, there are some cluster where uh, if you do a sync now, it crashes or something like that. I don't remember. So maybe it's not a good idea to do this now. Uh, by the way, you can run uh, the script, this script that uh, will create again uh, the, the trajectory that you can view with the Ovito, for example. This you can do while you are waiting for the, for the results. You see now it is longer and atoms moves a little bit. Uh, by the way, this code is super slow in my virtual machine. I don't know how it runs in yours. By the way, you can see atom that moves. Uh, I can make some comments maybe on that. Uh, you see the coordinates are not uh, wrapped inside the, inside the, the cell. Uh, the code always uh, uh, write uh, unwrapped the co coordinates. Uh, this is because with uh, those uh, unwrapped coordinates, it is easier to compute 
the mean square displacement, for example. Okay, there is a question. Is there any tricks to restart the molecular dynamic simulation uh, without uh, the restart feature working, basically? Uh, yes, exactly that. You can uh, copy the last uh, position from the input file, uh, copy the last velocities from uh, the output file to the input file. Uh, uh, be aware that the units of the velocities are somewhat tricky. Uh, what is the units? I think it was written here. Okay. So uh, the velocities has the units of, uh, okay, for the velocity you have a position, let's say a unit of length of a unit of time. Uh, this uh, is the same uh, as the uh, atomic position uh, input part, uh, and this is always atomic units uh, in the units of Carparinello. That means uh, 2.4 times 10 to the minus 17 seconds. I've written this number on my desk because I always forgot it. And this is the same. Uh, uh, as position. So those are the units of the velocities that you have to use if you use the input file. So basically you copy the uh, position and velocities as is because uh, in the output uh, it is a bore over atomic units of time, so it is okay. Uh, you specify bore for the position and uh, that's it. Then you have to do uh, the computation of the ground state with the conjugate gradient method. If you want, uh, you can compute also the velocities of the wave function. That means uh, if you use uh, non-conserving pseudo potential, and then you can start uh, from this restart file. So you will produce a restart file with this uh, conjugate gradient, and then you can run, run again the delay or whatever you want uh, using this restart file as uh, an input. And maybe I can mention in the meantime, so maybe it's finished. Let's see. Ba, ba, ba. The mods few. Oh, it's running. Okay. Uh, I can mention where you can find some documentation. Okay, you have this, and then uh, um, you can have a look also to the repository. So if you Google uh, Quantum Espresso GitLab, you end up in the, with the repository. Uh, with this repository, Quantum Espresso is there. And uh, you can find inside, inside this folder, CTV, uh, some documentation uh for uh, the caparinello method and there is uh, uh, a user guide that is in the process of uh, a lot of updates uh, where you can find some hints some uh, very useful information uh, to use the, this code there are a lot of stuff inside the, this file that uh, I, I didn't say anything about and uh, there are also yes everything there is a uh, the documentation for the autopilot module that is very useful when you start when you want to do some experiment here there is a different file and you see how can you change on the fly some parameters like you can put a file in the folder of the simulation uh, with uh, this uh, written inside and uh, and the code will start uh, in when they read the file will uh, will change the parameter that uh, you have written inside the file this is a mailbox file so there are these interesting uh, features so that uh, you can uh, you can use if you want uh, all this stuff is not necessary when you do a production run so when when you want to do your simulation for calculating your 
quantities of your system, obviously you are not going to change everything on the fly, but uh, this is useful for experimenting at the beginning. It is faster. So if you want, for example, to see what happens, if you use a larger time step, you can say, oh, let's try what happens. You put this file inside the folder, uh, and the time step will uh, instantly change, and you can see if uh, the simulation explodes or not. Uh, the most common error that the code's uh, uh, outputs is uh, ortho, ortho went bananas. That um, ortho is the part of the of the algorithm that uh, that um, it is an iterative algorithm that uh, uh, computes the orthonormality constraints that are uh, okay that, that computes uh, this and uh, it is iterative and if um, something went wrong usually the wave function become messed up and this, this algorithm is not able anymore to autonormalize the wave functions and uh, it prints out uh, ortho went bananas so if you see this message <laughs> this very fun bananas if you see this uh, usually you can try to lower the time step or maybe uh, you have lost uh, uh, you had uh, Maybe you, you don't have a gap anymore, or maybe mu was too big. So it means that um, electrons are no more for sure in the ground state, and you have something very, very wrong. So you can uh, you have to stop and look carefully at your simulation. Uh, be careful that on some, on some unstable systems, uh, like for example, I had this issue on, on the old Marconi KNL uh, cluster, uh, some have probably hardware instabilities uh, uh, made, made the simulation stable. So this error was appearing randomly during the simulation, but uh, everything was, uh, was okay. So it can be that uh, due to hardware issue, you can get this error too. But usually, uh, if you have this error and you look at the trajectory and you see the, that the electronic fictitious uh, energy is uh, going uh, to the stars, uh, um you have uh, to do something okay let's see if it is finished ah connection ah, i lost the vpn sorry okay what happens to the vpn My VPN stopped working. I don't know why. It is always like that. I stop to share because I don't see the error message that my computer is giving to me. Activation fail. Bob. Oh, sorry. Let's try to see if the other script works. No, it is in the post install directory. Okay, now I don't know why in my host computer does not work. Okay, okay, it works. Now we are seeing everything before the VPN stop stop working again. Okay, now the trajectory should be a lot longer. 
So now uh, I can run again this script that uh, now computes also the uh, percolation function and the uh, mean square displacement. Okay, now we can look also uh, at the thermodynamic quantities. Plot. Let's look at the temperature first. Okay, you see uh, that, uh, okay, it looks uh, okay. It's uh, equilibrated at the end of the day at something higher than uh, 600 Kelvin. You see that uh, the moment uh, in which uh, you, switch the, you switch off the thermostat uh, is important. Here, the same for, for example, I switched off uh, the thermostat in a point when the temperature was slightly higher. And so I got uh, a slightly higher temperature than 600 Kelvin. Uh, let's see who all the other data. Okay, you see the, the system was oscillating around this uh, total energy, but when I switched off the, off the thermostat, the total energy was uh, higher than the average, let's say, of the oscillations. So the temperature at the end is higher that, than 600. This is the potential energy. Okay? You see this on the high side of the oscillation. Then we can have a look um, at the constant of motion and everything. You see there is a jump. There is a jump because uh, I switched off the thermostat. So there are no more the thermostat degrees of freedom. And the constant of motion of the Lagrangian changed because uh, is a different, uh, the, the system is in a, a different state now. And it goes uh, here. Let's see if it is constant enough. Okay, super constant, you see. Uh, it is uh, really, really constant. So the constant of motion is okay. The electronic uh, kinetic energy is okay. It is more or less a constant. And this is the physical uh, uh, constant, uh, the physical constant, the physical total energy, kinetic energy of the ions plus potential energy that is calculated with the density functional theory. It's more or less a constant, so I think that simulation is, is okay. Uh, so we are happy. We are happy with it. Uh, if you want, you can have a look uh, at the trajectory. Let's have a look at the trajectory. So after executing the analysis uh, thing, uh, you can have a bigger, longer trajectory. Okay, you see that some atoms uh, went uh, pretty pretty far from their their original uh, positions, uh, and they're going uh, a lot uh, away from the cell. So the system looks like uh, a fluid or a gas. Well, we have a really, really few uh, particles, few mo water molecules. So it's hard to say what it is this is. But anyway, we have it there. Uh, ah, uh, the analysis script, uh, this is uh, what is inside. You can uh, have a look at it if you are interested, but it's not related to quantum espresso. So it's something more that. Uh, I put here only to show you what it is possible to calculate with the molecular dynamic uh, trajectory. There are some commands that compute the mean square displacement uh, and the pair correlation function. Now let's uh, have a look at them. I prepared some, some scripts to, to, to show them. Uh, plot, let's say for the, let's start from the pair correlation function. Okay, this is the percolation function. Uh, on the x axis, there is the radial distance in angstrom. And uh, on the y axis, is there are arbitrary units. These uh, plots are not normalized. But uh, let's look at the peak. You see, there is a very big peak here. This is related to the oxygen hydrogen bond. And you see, it is right, it is about one angstrom. 
So we are happy because uh, our wet water molecules looks like uh, water molecules. So this is a uh, uh, oxygen hydrogen uh, pair correlation function. I remember you that is uh, this is an, an histogram practically. So the code uh, tries to calculate uh, all the distance in this case between uh, hydrogens with a central atom that is uh, oxygen. Maybe that is if I write somewhere. So suppose that uh, here you have uh, an oxygen and then you have uh, many hydrogens here, here, and oxygen here. Okay, put uh, random positions. So I look uh, at all the distance between the central oxygen atoms and uh, any other hydrogen atoms. And I put uh, those distance, R1, R2, R3. I will have a list of them. And uh, I, I did an histogram of this. And I have uh, this uh, blue plot. If I do the same, but uh, I keep, for example, the central atom uh, an hydrogen. Then I compute hydrogen, the distance of uh, other hydrogen atoms with respect to this central hydrogen atoms. And I have, uh, I will have uh, another distance, uh, prime one, uh, prime two, and a lot more. And I will have the, this, uh, this uh, plot here, the hydrogen, hydrogen, uh, Pair correlation function. You see, here you have a peak that is related uh, to your oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen. This is related to this distance, the first peak. And you see, it is around 1.5, uh, that is true. It is, uh, this angle is almost 100 degrees, so it is uh, okay. And then you have uh, oxygen oxygen correlation function, uh, percolation function. And you see that uh, two oxygens uh, start to see each other at uh, <laughs> 2.5 something angstrom. So they are uh, parted than the other molecules, uh, at the other atoms in the molecule. So this is it. And uh, at the end, you see there is a lot of noise. The simulation is very small and uh, you cannot compute, uh, you cannot have a uh, large statistics for, uh, for these simulations. So this is noise. Then we can have a look at the mean square displacement. Then I will finish. This almost the end. Okay, this is the script I prepared. For you, it's nothing special. It's all, only has some. Uh... Okay, this is a, a mean square displacement plot. Uh, you see, um, there is the oxygen, oxygen, and the hydrogen mean square displacement. Uh, what is mean square displacement? So, I, I did I put a formula. And okay, here it is. So um, you are computing an average. This is a, a, an average over the trajectory of, uh, okay, here you have a sum over all the atoms and you divide also by the number of the atoms of this type. So you, you, you pick, uh, um, let's say, uh, <clears throat> an oxygen atom or an hydrogen atom, let's say hydrogen, you have a starting position at t equals zero. Then this atom goes, uh, goes away during the trajectory. You have t equal uh, 32, t equal 42, whatever. And you are here now. Whatever. And uh, the mean square displacement is simply the difference between uh, uh, this position, between the position at uh, every given time and the initial position squared. And you get, you get this plot here. 
So what can happen in this case? It can happen that uh, if it is a solid, for example, the atom will, um, will always uh, uh, stay near its, uh, near its uh, initial position. And so you expect that uh, the mean square displacement, uh, uh, if you were at time, does something like that. At the beginning, it will move a little bit and it will stay still. Um, but uh, this is not what is happening here. So after an initial uh, uh, transition, let's say, uh, initial uh, transient, uh, transient uh, moment, you can um, have uh, some uh, equilibrium behavior, let's say, that if the system is uh, liquid or uh, a gas, it is uh, something like uh, a line with a constant slope. So we have something here, then a line. And you can compute the diffusion coefficients by looking at the, the slope of, uh, of the line. This is the diffusion diffusion coefficient, okay? Uh, so here it looks like uh, we have uh, a diffusing system. And another thing that you can notice from this plot is that uh, the two lines uh, here are more or less parallel. That uh, is something that we are ex expecting since uh, we have a molecular system. So the molecules uh, are always uh, bonded within uh, themselves. So uh, they are not uh, dissociating. The hydrogens uh, of the water molecules stay always uh, near the oxygen of the their water molecule. So they go together. Okay, so if uh, we had a lot more time on the x axis, we will see that uh, the plus basically will go one on the top of the other. Okay. Okay, so that's the end of the tutorial. And uh, if you if there are any, any other question, I'm here. If not, uh, we can uh, meet later on the talk. Say, I would say we leave the, the Zoom open anyway, in okay. case uh, somebody, but we can stop the streaming. And we, I mean, we wish uh, the, to, to see the participants tomorrow as well. And uh, we thank you, Ricardo, very much for the, for the lab. Yeah. But uh, but definitely we leave the Zoom open in case sometimes needs help. We we stay around and we can we can jump in if needed. Okay, perfect. Okay. By the way, what was the time of the end of? The... I think twelve thirty. Okay, so yeah. two minutes uh, thirty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs>